Well, hi there. Welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, on behalf of Alice and myself and the Bible Talk ministry, we want to greet you in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we continue on in our study of the Sermon on the Mount, which is true Christ mm. That's the definition. If you want to see what true Christianity is supposed to look like, go read the Sermon on the Mount. Or check all of these studies that we've done on the Sermon on the Mount. That may be a help to you. Uh, I, we're continuing on. We For the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at the issue of judging. Mm. What you're supposed to judge, what you're not supposed to judge. And I just want to do a recap of that and look at it. Because we're going. this will be our last time in that particular subject during this part of the program in any event, all right? So before we do that, I'm going to ask my sweet patootie Alice over here, if you will ask God's, you are, you're my sweet patootie, ask God's blessing on our time together in his word. Hallelujah. Father, we just praise you and we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Yes, Lord. Who gave his life for us. Yes, and Lord, we just pray that the word that you're putting into Alan's heart today will go out and touch the hearts of others. Yes, Lord. And that lives will be changed by your word, because that is the promise, the power of your word brings change. And Lord, we just bless you and thank you for the opportunity that we do have and the technology that allows us to get this message out. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. And I, I think it would be a good just point to, to remind us all, including me, that as we do this study, you know, the, the word says that knowledge puffs up, puffs up but love builds, builds up. up. Mm. And Paul wrote to Timothy and said that the goal of our instruction is love. The reason that we are in God's word is to grow in our knowledge of his love for us and his love for others. Because that's his love for others is the same love that we're supposed to have for others. That's right. That's right. And that certainly is pertinent to the issue of judging that we're going to look at in Matthew chapter 7. So while I just talk a second, <laughs> why don't you grab your Bibles, open to Matthew chapter 7. And again, I'll always suggest a couple of things. That you have a, a pencil and paper or a pen and paper to write down and jot down some notes as we go through the study. And of course, be in your Bible is a good thing, mm -hmm. to test what I'm saying and make sure that what I'm saying lines up with the Word of God, mm -hmm. all right? Um, you, when we talk about judging, we're talking about examining all things, testing all things, holding fast to that which is good. If you're not judging the prophets, how will you know, how will you know the false prophets from the true prophets? That's if you're right. not judging the teaching, if you're not discerning whether it lines up with the whole Word of God, you know, like the prophet Isaiah said so very long ago, to the to the Word and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this, they have no dawn in them. What you hear has to line up with the Word of God because it is His Word that He uses to lead us in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. That's right. Okay? Don't trust me. Test me. Mm -hmm. And that is true of all the teaching that you hear. Not to be judgmental, well, to be discerning about it, yes. absolutely. Yeah. To Churches, be able to, yeah, yeah. The church definitely needs to be using discernment. Yes, because we need to make sure that what we're hearing is from God. Amen. All right? All right. So Matthew chapter 7. The last few times we've been talking about the issue of judging. Um, you know, Jesus said, do not judge so you'll not be judged. Right. From the way you judge, you'll be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured unto you. Okay, why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So that's what we've been talking about for the last three programs. And, and I talked about the things, there are things that we are absolutely not to judge. Yes. The scripture says, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and says that we're not to judge outsiders. God judges the outsiders. And I talked last week, I think, about how, how ready we are within the body of Christ to judge those people outside the church mm -hmm. and talk about their gross sins. Trust me, their sins are gross. But if you've been with us in the Sermon on the Mount, you understand that Jesus is saying that anger 
without cause is the same has the same weight as murder. Looking at a woman with lust has the same weight as adultery. You know, that's why you need to understand this is the teaching that defines Christianity. We we measure things by our man's world's standards. Mm -hmm. We need to be trained. We need not to be thinking like the world, or let me put it another way, we need to not be conformed to the world, but we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, as Paul said in Romans chapter right. 12. So that's the purpose of this, is to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, being, being changed by the Word of God in our lives, all right? We're talking about the outsiders. That, those are the unbelievers. Not, Though, not outside the building. No, no. Uh, amen. <laughs> yeah, inside. Okay, outside the building. I mean, yes, let me tell you, and I said this before, I'll say it again. Homosexuality is a sin. Yes. So is greed. Yes. So is all forms, are all forms of immorality. Yes. So is lying. Lying, I mean, sits at the top of the list. If you go and read Proverbs chapter, chapter 6, you know, the six things the Lord hates, yeah, even seven are an abomination. And, and the first thing is pride, haughty eyes. And right below that is a lying tongue. We need to understand that these things, the world is going to do those things. Yes. We can't expect righteous behavior, behavior from unrighteous people. Right. But we should be evidencing these things in the, our lives, the lives of believers. Right. Because our, the purpose of our lives, the, pur the very purpose of our lives here is to bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus. Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Who is holy, right? That's right. And that's the interaction we need to have with the yeah. unbelievers, the people in the yeah. world. Is The, the, the uh, interaction is to be bringing them the good news, the gospel. Right. So, but in the, in the church... This is why it says, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye? That's right. It's talking about brothers. It's That's talking right. about brothers and sisters in the Lord. Right. Okay? And there's a criteria. He said, don't judge. But now he says, you know, before you judge, you got to check yourself out. Right. And this is what we said before. You know, if you see your brother sin, go to him and him alone. But before you do that, you had better take a look in the mirror. And make sure that the, that the sin that God is showing you it's is not being right. shown to you, right. that it might be exposed in your own life, all right? So, the reason I want to get into this and just understand this about judgment, and I say, well, I think we've covered it fairly well in the last three, three programs, is because of the very next verse mm -hmm. here in Matthew chapter 7. That verse, Jesus says, do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Yeah, that's verse well, 6. How do we get from talking about judgment to talking about... Dogs and swines. Uh, what, giving what's holy to dogs and, you know, pearls be to, before swine. How did we? Is is Jesus Christ just kind of bouncing around? Is he is he thinking and talking randomly? And it just there has to be a connection. Absolutely. God is a God of good order. There is a reason that he talked about judgment and then goes right into this. Don't give what's holy to dogs. Is he talking about the unbelievers? Because you see, Jews always thought of un, un, the goy, yeah. the Gentiles, Gentiles as the dogs. dogs. You know what? Judgment comes first to the household of God. Mm -hmm. One of the things, if we're going to look at this verse, and indeed we are, you have to understand is we're not talking about your sweet little puppy dog that you're holding your arms and pet it. Not. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about we're talking about dogs that are mangy, that are out in the street. These are not pets. No. You know, I, here in we're here in the United Kingdom at the moment. We we are from originally from the United States. Still, we're just uh, kind of bounce around. But anyhow, we've lived in the mission field, mm. just for example, in Central America, out in the bush. They have dogs down there. They're not their cute little puppies. Mm. These are dogs that scavenge. Yes. These are dogs that are unloved. Uh, well, they're, they're <laughs> unloved and, you know, not being loved. Yeah. They don't return love. No. They, they really don't. Same thing in Africa. I mean, we've traveled in East Africa, West Africa. 
and you see animals over there, they're not the cute little pets that you're accustomed to or yeah. we're accustomed to here in the Western world. That's right. So when he's talking about the dogs here, he's talking about animals that are they're, they're scavengers. How many times in Scripture does it talk about in the Old Testament about people that die, that their blood will be lapped up by the dogs? Yes. Yeah. These are dogs that go around and bite and, and, and chew at everything. Snap. Snap, yes. Yeah. They're not nice. Same thing with pigs. I mean, you know, this is not Porky Pig in the cartoons. This is big animals that, that rut through the, through the mud, the muck and the mire and, and the garbage. Um, what's the connection to judging? Yes. Well, when you're going to judge, one of the things you need to know, and don't throw your, 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 what's holy before dogs or the pearls before swine, is that it says in Proverbs, let me just go here for a moment. In Proverbs, I think it's chapter 9. Let me, yes. let me check. Nine. Proverbs 9. Eight, I think. Yes, Proverbs 9, 8. It says in Proverbs 9, 8, and you should be doing what Alice is doing. Mm -hmm. Check it out, all right? Mm -hmm. Do not reprove a scoffer, or he will hate you. Mm. Reprove a wise man, and he will love you. Amen. Well, let me ask you first of all, what does it mean to reprove? To correct. To correct. Doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So if I were to go, for example, to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, I could read that all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Mm -hmm. You see, because if you see your brother's sin, if you see error in his life, and you go to him to lovingly correct. Now, this is what the difference is between judging as so often thought of in the church. Judging the way they think of is for condemnation. I'm going to tell you what our evil, rotten, rotten think you are. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's saying something for condemnation. The purpose of judging is correction. Yes. Training in righteousness. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, I was having a conversation with a brother here the other day, yesterday, I think. And I said, suppose you have, you hire, you, as a matter of fact, we have a dear brother here. And he's taking his children. They're being trained in tennis. And they happen to be very skilled and talented. So mm -hmm. that's another story. Mm -hmm. But he, they have a trainer. I mean, they go to a, like a camp in a fitness center. And they have, a, they have a couple of instructors. So the instructor watches what they do. Tells them, you know, what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. Then watches how they execute what they've been told. Yes. And if they're doing something good, hallelujah, he encourages them. Yes. Telling them that, they're doing that, that you're doing that great. Keep it up. Mm -hmm. But if they're doing something wrong, if they're swinging, they're holding the racket incorrectly, if they're swinging, he will go and he correct will them. correct them. Yes. Okay? Is that, is that judging? Of course it's judging. Of course it's judging. He's seeing that they're doing something wrong. And he's going to them and telling them that they're doing something wrong. Is his purpose to condemn them? No, his purpose is to train them, to correct them. The judgment that is supposed to exist in the church is for that purpose. For the purpose of correction. For the purpose of training in righteousness. For the purpose of blessing. Amen. That's what it's about. It's a good thing. <laughs> we have just allowed... That, you know, our flesh to rise up and allow the judgment to become Amen. condemnation. Right, yeah. Get over it. Stop it. Stop it right now before it's too late. But I pray, you know, David prayed. Mm -hmm. I can't, I don't remember which psalm, right offhand. I think it's in the 140s. And he prayed, he prayed mm -hmm. that God would send people into his life to discipline him, mm -hmm. to reprove him. And then he prayed that his head would not reject it. Because you want to know something? Our flesh doesn't like to be corrected. Mm -mm -mm -mm. No, our doesn't. flesh, no, because our pride says we're never wrong. That's right. But the Word of God says we're hardly ever right. <laughs> so we should be desiring that training. Mm. Well, no, let me, let me change that. And instead of saying training, let me say we should desire, greatly desire, that discipling in our life. Yes. Because we're supposed to be disciples of the Master, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. 
We need him to tell us what's right and what's wrong. We need to hear him say to us, well done, thou good and faithful servant, when we're doing it right, to encourage us, to strengthen us. Just as much we need to hear him say, you're doing it wrong. Because he'll say it lovingly for the purpose of getting us to do it right. I can remember when uh, earlier on in the ministry, in our ministry, that there were men that came to you and said, I want you to disciple me. Those were the days, yeah. yeah. I mean, you don't hear that today. Very much, yes. You hear mentor. <laughs> right. And Alice has a good point because a mentor mentor comes from, I'm sure you, if you've heard any of our programs, you, you've probably heard me say this. Mentor comes from Greek philosophy. It comes, I believe, from, from Homer's writings, either the Odyssey or the Iliad. And he talked about how one of the kings who was going to fight in Troy set this man whose name was Mentor to be an advisor to his son at, at, while he was gone. A mentor is an advisor. Masters don't give you advice. They give you commands. Yes. There is a difference. A big difference. A, a very big difference. So, so, yes, I want to have... Listen, I recognize the fact that I have not. And I'm sure you've recognized it more than I have. I'm not perfect. Hallelujah. Close. Well, you know what? I may not be perfect yet. That's right. But I am the work of his hands. He is the potter and I am the clay. Mm. And he is at work in my life Amen. to perfect me. And the way he does that is by removing the imperfections. You, Perfection doesn't come from having something added to your life. I mean, we are. The moment you were saved, you became a new creation in Christ Jesus. You have Christ in you. you have, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You have what you need. The problem is you have things you don't need. You have things you shouldn't have. This is like, you know, I, I think it was, I always get confused here, whether it was Michelangelo or Da Vinci. I think it was Michelangelo that, you know, that sculpted the statue, the David, you know, that's such a, a famous, one of the most famous statues. And, and he was asked one time, how can you look at this block of stone? I mean, just a big, big block of granite or marble or whatever it was and and, and be able to chip away, and all of a sudden, there's this incredible rendering mm. of David. And he said, well, it's very simple. I cut away everything that's not David. That's what God is doing with us. That is exactly what God is doing in our lives, in the lives of his bondservants, in the lives of those who desire to be more like him. He's cutting away the things that are not him. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's discipline. It's discipling. I, I think we have to get that desire in our hearts to say, Lord, I, I know what I am. Paul said in Romans 7, the very thing I hate, I continue to do. But he went on because he knew the amazing grace of the Lord. And in, in there in Romans, he said that in Romans 7, and he starts Romans 8 by saying, but there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. God's purpose is not condemnation. Peter wrote and he said that the Father desires that none should perish. All of his action, all of his, all of he is doing, his purpose is to bring that the salvation to change people. What's God's purpose in your life? What's God's promise in your life? This is the, the promise, the great promise, whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. Christ Jesus. Amen. Romans 8. Go read it. You see, the, the purpose of this is, in the beginning, God said, after he said, let there be light, you know, right along there, he said, let us make man in our image. And he formed Adam out of the dust of the earth. He breathed life into him, and Adam was created in the image of God. Amen. However, Adam sinned and fell away. He became deformed. Mm -hmm. he, did no, he no longer looked like the God who had made him in that God's, our God's image. So his purpose, this is the purpose of God from that point on. Man with his free will, God's desire is that we would love him out of our free will. God has been offering to those who will receive it, being changed back into the image of God, into the image of his son Christ Jesus. It comes by discipline. 
It comes by cutting, cutting the, the cancer of sin out of our lives. Right. If somebody's dying of cancer, you know, it's not, it's not a matter of putting more or less. You, you cut away what's there, right? So okay, the, don't get distracted. The holy. The holy. What's holy? Well, Jesus is holy. Yes. His word it says holy. is pure and holy. Okay? The pearls. Jesus told a parable, Matthew 13, and he talks about how the kingdom of God is like this great pearl, a pearl of great price. These are the things that we have to bring to our brothers and sisters who are in error, is to bring that holy word, because the word, all scripture, is profitable for reproof and correction and training in righteousness. That's right. But what happens, what happens when they begin to trample it? What, what happens when they begin to snarl at you and bite at you and mm. snap at you? What happens when they treat it like garbage and just rut through it and cast it away? Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I was reading in, in Proverbs chapter 9. Mm. You know, what are you going to do when somebody's scoffing? Don't, don't give that reproof to, to a scoff. I, I'll give you an example of this. Many years ago, many, 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 many years ago, many, 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 many years ago, back in the 1970s, when I had been used by a guy to start a congregation out of a Bible study in New York, and we had this fellowship, and there was one couple, I love this couple, I mean, they're saved, hallelujah, they're brother and sister in the Lord, but they used to argue bitterly and be contentious with one another, mm -hmm. and it was really bad. And I, the, playing the role that I had as a pastor, I would bring a word of correction to them. And I would do it, I'll tell you something, I mean, I would, I would do it forcefully. I would bring, discipline needs to be strong sometimes, you know. And I would correct them, and I would say, whatever, I'd bring some word to them. Right. And they'd repent. Yeah, and they'd repent. And then, one evening, I can remember, we were sitting at their house, we were having dinner at their house, we were sitting at the kitchen table, and they started up again, and they're arguing and arguing and arguing, and I sat there. And finally, the two of them stopped, and they looked at me, and they said, why aren't you correcting us? Why aren't you giving us the yeah. scriptures? <laughs> Why aren't you? It, I mean, it shocked them. That they realized that I was sitting there and not giving them the word. I said, because it says don't. Don't. What does it say in Romans 9? Uh, go back and read it there. One more time. Proverbs 9. Oh, Proverbs 9. You said um, Romans. Um, I, well, Romans is, is nice too. Yes. <laughs> the, okay. Do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man and he will love you. So I had been bringing this, I was reproving them mm -hmm. until they started becoming scoffers. When they were treating, when they were trampling it underfoot, when they were, they become like snarling dogs and they were not receiving the word. Well, that time, I think, had more impact on their lives than all the other times prior to it. Because they realized what danger they were in that God would stop giving them correction. Yes. Yeah. You may not like the feeling of being disciplined by God, but maybe you better go read Hebrews chapter 12 again, where it says he disciplines those whom he loves, where it talks about the fact that if he doesn't discipline you, you're not his child, and where it talks about the fact that by the discipline of the Lord, we become partakers in his holiness. Lord, discipline us. Train us, Lord God. Instruct us, Lord God. Yes. That we might not become scoffers, that we, but that we might become more and more like you. Because that most assuredly should be the desire of our hearts, to be more like you. So I, I want you to see the connection, because Jesus doesn't ramble. No, he does not. So when he went from talking about judgment... When he started talking about that, and then goes to this verse about don't give what's holy to dogs, do not throw your pearls before swine, or they'll trample them under their feet. He is talking about discipline. Okay. Matthew 7, 7. I'm going to start reading from there. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, 
will give him a stone. Or he asks for a fish, he'll not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? Now, okay. How did, we, how did we get from talking about dogs and pigs, puppy dogs, puppies and piggies, how did we get from talking about puppies and piggies to all of a sudden talking about ask, seek, find? Because it is absolutely interconnected, yes. as is the whole Word of God. If were you to go to the Gospel of Luke, and you know what? Why don't you do this for your homework? Yes, go ahead. find the equivalent of this, the corresponding verses in the Gospel of Luke, and you will find that what he is talking about is the Holy Spirit. How much more will he give you the Holy Spirit, if you ask? Because what does the Holy Spirit do in your life? Well, it is the power of Amen. God in your life. It gives you the power to deal, to make this transformation from the old man into living as the new man. Yes. But more than that, having the Holy Spirit within you will give you the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And we will see the significance of that in our next study, I'm sure, as we go down more in the, in the Gospel of Matthew. Because it is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It is that love it is that joy. It is that peace. It is that long-suffering, that patience. I'm not going to go through the whole list now, but the simple fact of the matter, without a love of God, you're not going to be able to receive that, that correction. You'll not. Mm -hmm. without, that, without the fruit of the Holy Spirit, without the joy of the Lord, when you get corrected, you're going to be a miserable little child. You're going to go off and sulk someplace and, and complain bitterly about it. Without the fruit of the Holy Spirit, how in the world are you going to have that peace that passes understanding that will give you the power to make this transformation, being transformed by the renewing of your mind, to live the words, the incredible, beautiful words of the Sermon on the Mount. When you have the fruit of the Holy Spirit, you know what you're going to want? You're going to want God's instruction in your life. Absolutely. You will desire that because you will have the spirit of truth within you. And the truth is God's purpose, God's plan is to keep changing us, to mold us, mm -hmm. to shape us into the image of his son, Christ Jesus. Why? Be because we'll be nicer people? No, because we will be more faithful witnesses of the love of God in the world. For that is our purpose for being here. Our purpose for being here, we are to be a people of praise. We are to proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. But we are to bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place. In order to do that, we need to look like Christ Jesus right. more and more each day. And Father, I just rejoice. I thank you. That that is your work in our lives, that you are doing that. You're doing it through your word. A sword, sharp, sharpen any two-edged sword, as you cut away the things in our life that should not be there. Lord, that we might just be more and more showing, making visible the love of your son, Christ Jesus, to the people who are living in a lost and dark world. Thank you for making us the light of the world and the salt of the earth, Father. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, it's Amen. always a blessing to be with you. It's always a blessing to spend time in the Word of God. Amen. I promise you. John the Baptist said his joy was made full because he heard the voice of the bridegroom. Lord Until God. next time, God bless you. Goodbye. So I cherish that old rugged cross till my trophy